Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Traeger, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Recovery and Resiliency. Uh, today we will discuss the city's progress on federally funded resiliency projects and assess what can be done to ensure that the city and uh, each borough is receiving their share of resiliency funding efficiently and equitably, uh, especially since we are on uh, the eve of, of the 50 year anniversary of Superstorm Sandy and of course our hearts and prayers and thoughts remain with all those affected uh, in Texas and in Florida, the Gulf Coast, the Gulf Coast, uh, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands and all those who have been really in Mexico who have been victims of such uh, significant natural disasters and I actually now <coughs> use the term that we are in this together whether you live in Puerto Rico or Coney Island or Sunset Park or Staten Island where climate change refugees, those who have been affected and been displaced. Earlier this year, we held an oversight hearing on the progress of recovery and resiliency projects in NYCHA developments. Our April hearing on the city's electrical grid shed light on storm hardening and other measures for our utility resiliency. In June, we discussed the importance of coastal resiliency in mitigating beach erosion uh, to protect communities in high-risk flood zones. Today, we want to examine where the city is overall with its resiliency efforts with a particular focus on large federally funded resiliency projects that the city administers. Hurricane Sandy was an unprecedented storm. It brought uh, over $19 billion worth of damage to New York City. Uh, over 2 million residents lost power spanning from several days up to weeks. Reports show that without resiliency measures like the hardening of our, uh, of our coastlines and electrical grid or floodwater mitigation, the city could face losses five times higher than Sandy with costs over $90 billion. Federal agencies, including the Departments of Housing and Urban Development, the Federal Transit Administration, and the Federal Emergency Management Authority have allocated almost $6 billion for resiliency efforts in New York City. Studies have been commissioned, and some areas have seen construction on resiliency projects, but there is much left to do. Most post-Sandy projects for permanent work continue to be in design and planning phases. The committee would like clarity on how the city communicates and collaborates with federal funding partners, how appropriated funds are drawn down, how the city determines which areas can begin construction, and how the city studies neighborhoods for comprehensive resiliency planning and not merely uh, by funding individual resiliency projects, and of course how community input uh, is, being, is being collected. Uh, New York City must do everything it can to prepare for major weather events, which are becoming alarmingly more disastrous in America and abroad. Uh, working efficiently towards the construction of resiliency projects can help protect the city and our residents' businesses and critical infrastructure against extreme weather events. New York City was ahead of the curve a decade ago when it began to develop resiliency plans directly addressing climate change. Uh, of course, we want to move from plans to implementation. Uh, we want to continue looking forward to address global warming and work diligently to implement these plans. Uh, thank you to those who prepared uh, for today's hearing, including uh, Anna Scaife, my Deputy Chief of Staff, Committee Counsel Malika Jobali, Finance Analyst John Seltzer, and Legislative Fellow Adam Mengler. Uh, the committee uh, look forward to, to hearing testimony today from the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency, the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget, uh, and Community uh, Advocates. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to call uh, on the first panel. and. We have uh, John Grathwell from OMB, and uh, we have uh, Dan Zarilli, uh, the uh, senior, I think, climate change advisor, but formerly from uh, ORR. Uh, so if you can please just raise your right hands. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Great. I just want to recognize that we've been joined by uh, Council Member Perkins, uh, Minority Leader Matteo, and Council Member Menchaca. And you may begin. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Council Member Traeger. Good afternoon. My name is Dan Zarilli, the Mayor's Senior Director for Climate Policy and Programs. Uh, I want to thank you, the members of the committee, uh, for this opportunity to speak about the progress that the de Blasio administration has made in building a stronger, more resilient city since Hurricane Sandy. As you, uh, as you indicated, five years ago, of course, Hurricane Sandy devastated New York City with unprecedented force, claiming 44 lives in the five boroughs and causing over $19 billion in damages and lost economic activity. It was the worst natural disaster we've ever faced. As we took stock of the damage, it was clear that to us that we could not just simply plan to recover from the storm. Instead, we needed to use this moment 
to address the multiple climate risks, including coastal storms, that threaten our city and its residents. The result was an over $20 billion resiliency program, what was uh, referred to as the SUR program, now part of uh, our 1MYC resiliency program uh, in Vision 4 of that document, grounded in the best available science, supporting all New Yorkers in every borough. And on behalf of the, the, the mayor, I want to thank the council for being our partner in these efforts. The necessity of this work has never been clearer. We've seen this year's hurricane season, Harvey, Irma, Maria, which tragically devastated communities along the Gulf Coast and on several Caribbean islands. It's not only reaffirmed the need for our climate resiliency work, but also highlighted its urgency. That's why we're making bold and innovative investments in preparedness and resiliency. Sim simultaneously, we're acting with every urgency to deliver complex, first-of-their-kind coastal defense projects in vulnerable communities across our coastal uh, uh, city. To be clear, as we mark the fifth anniversary of Hurricane Sandy and take stock of our progress, our city is safer and more resilient than it was before Hurricane Sandy, and we have much more to do before we'll be satisfied. So before I continue, it goes without saying that everything you'll hear today is the product of a massive team effort led out of the mayor's office and implemented by nearly every city agency and includes state and federal agencies as partners, as well as a myriad of community organizations and private and philanthropic partners as well. I'd like to personally thank each of them for all they do to help make our city and our nation more resilient. So how are we safer? Let's quickly highlight some of the, the key elements of our progress. Our coastal defenses are being implemented and our stormwater management efforts are stronger, including a new Rockaway boardwalk with integrated coastal protections along five and a half miles of the Rockaway Peninsula shoreline, completed tea groins in Seagate, nearly 10 miles of new dunes across the Rockaway Peninsula and in Staten Island, new sand that was placed on our public beaches. Construction is underway on new sewer infrastructure in Southeast Queens and expanded blue belts in Staten Island to reduce the impacts of flooding, and much more is coming. Our emergency preparedness plans and equipment are stronger, including significantly improved risk communication tools like floodhelpny.org, updated evacuation maps, a new Notify NYC map, and interim flood protection at critical city facilities. Our electrical grid, as you indicated, is better protected thanks to important investments in Con Ed's energy infrastructure through a nearly $1 billion hardening effort at critical substations and across the distribution network. Our water supply is safer thanks to continued investments by DEP to ensure uninterrupted access to high-quality drinking water, including a new backup water siphon to Staten Island that was announced at last year's anniversary. Our infrastructure is stronger. This includes upgraded traffic infrastructure, hardened telecommunications systems, new green infrastructure, and the work we're doing to continue to fortify our wastewater treatment plants, all of which ensures that vital public services continue during and after emergencies, which as we've seen in, in the recent hurricanes in uh, Puerto Rico is so vital to make sure that we can protect our vital public services like the electric grid, our water supply system. All of this is changing the physical reality of what we're doing here in New York City and, and the ability for us to face the threats of climate change. And finally, our, our neighborhoods are more resilient. Tens of thousands of households are benefiting from investments in our single family, multifamily, and our public housing uh, resiliency and recovery programs. Building and zoning codes have been upgraded to better address the threats of climate change. Every school damage during Sandy was up and running in record time, and we continue to make significant progress making those schools safer and more resilient. We've provided $54 million, uh, sorry, $54 million to hundreds of local small businesses to assist in the recovery from Sandy and launched business prep programs to support their long-term resiliency as well. By focusing on these key areas since Hurricane Sandy, we are confident that our neighborhoods, buildings, infrastructure, and coastal defenses are stronger and our city's resiliency efforts would save lives. Never nevertheless, we must go further, and that's exactly what we're doing. So to conclude, before I hand it over to John, we've, we have accomplished much. We have much more to do. I want to thank the council, the members of this committee for their leadership and for your close partnership as we continue to take the critical steps necessary to build a stronger, more resilient New York. And now let me turn to John Grathwell to testify on our federally funded resiliency grants programs, and then we'll be happy to take questions at the conclusion. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Chair Traeger, members of the Committee on Recovery and Resiliency, I'm John Grathwell, a Deputy Director at the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget. Thanks to the efforts of so many, including my colleagues at OMB, the City has secured more than $14 billion in federal aid for its Sandy recovery. Today I will update you on this funding picture for recovery and resiliency projects and provide additional financial details on the progress Dan Zerilli has covered in his testimony. So first, federal disaster recovery grants are a critical and essential source of funding for resiliency and recovery <laughs> projects, but it's important to remember that they are not the only source of funds for these activities. We have a variety of other, we have city dollars, we have other 
partners doing work in the region, for example, Con Ed, Army Corps of Engineers. The funds of, from these two main federal agencies are the focus of my testimony today. And let me say grants are contracts. These federal grants are contracts between the city and the federal government. The city must satisfy certain requirements in the spending of these dollars. The city is reimbursed by the federal government for eligible costs spent in the course of recovery after completing a long process that includes completing projects in part or in whole, documenting expenditures and other required information, and submitting reimbursement packages to our federal grantors. Uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, provided most of the disaster recovery grant funding to the city from Sandy. FEMA aid is provided for specific approved public infrastructure investments. HUD funds come in the form of a block grant. The, and the, the recovery itself can be separated into two overlapping but distinct phases. The initial phase, which is the emergency phase, primarily focused on life, health, and public safety concerns immediately after disaster. And a longer term permanent construction and repair phase is the second phase. So the first phase, which focuses on life, health, and public safety concerns that are generally non-construction in nature, like shelter, sheltering and de debris removal. In this phase, federal aid is designed to be available to the recovery communities quickly. That is because, the funding because of the funding system design and the nature of the work. Laws and regulations governing emergency response efforts do not have the same requirements as permanent infrastructure restoration. This allows recovering communities to ensure the most critical emergency response needs are addressed in a timely fashion. And as Dan pointed out in his testimony, emergency measures can also achieve resiliency. Now, I'm going to turn your attention to what I brought along here as far as charts go. I will call this chart number one. Is that clear and visible generally? Okay. This chart, the line is the cumulative dollar value of federal grant amount for emergency response activities from FEMA. And the city secured approximately $1.1 billion in FEMA public assistance funding for emergency work quickly. It rose very quickly and then leveled out. Within the first 12 months, some federal funding and reimbursements on this stream of FEMA funds remain to be secured. However, most of the work is complete and the city continues to compile, reconcile, and submit needed documentation to New York State and to FEMA for reimbursement. As of today, FEMA has awarded $1.7 billion in total em emergency work grants. Now the second phase, the long-term construction phase of requiry, requires extensive pre-grant award work as New York State and FEMA must agree on eligible recovery projects. This process takes longer, is more technical, and is more technical than securing grant funding for emergency <laughs> protective measures that are displayed, you know, up here on this chart. <laughs> Though the city received $520 million in FEMA permanent work funding by the fourth quarter of 2014, <laughs> most of it was awarded in 2015. By the end of the fourth quarter of 2015, three years and two months after the President issued a disaster declaration on October 30, 2012, the city's cumulative award was about $6.8 billion. This sharp increase from 2014 to 2015 is due in large part to the city's participation in a FEMA pilot program for permanent work, the Section 428 program. The city participated in the Section 428 program out of our desire to secure federal funding more quickly and to provide New York City with more flexibility in how these funds are used. To date, the city has been awarded $8.2 billion in permanent work FEMA funding, including some other federal grants some of which were mentioned by the chair at the beginning of this hearing. The city, is the city is managing recovery on a very large number of Sandy damage sites. We have FEMA grants funding 477 projects. Most of these are to remediate multiple damaged sites and facilities. Several of these grants even include hundreds of sites. <laughs> Despite the complex funding process, a large volume of design work coordination and several reviews that must occur for each project, the city's agencies have been very effective at obtaining grant funding. 
We anticipate securing some additional long-term recovery funds over the next few years, designated primarily for hazard mitigation, additional hazard mitigation funds on grants we've already received. And, you know, moving to the timing of this second funding, you know, this is the graphical version of what I just went through in my testimony where for the years through the end of 2014, the amount of grant dollars we've received from FEMA for this permanent work was percolating along at a fairly slow level, then it jumped very quickly, and you see it's grown since the end of 2015 <laughs> as well. But it took us a number of years going through the detailed site-by-site -site visit with FEMA and the state, documenting all the damages and everything required to put together the grants for this funding stream. So moving quickly to HUD, Congress appropriated and HUD awarded for the city $4.2 in community development block grant disaster recovery funding, which includes the Build It Back program, along the timeline I have on this chart. The, the city completed the necessary analysis and documentation required by HUD and received approval for our first action plan on May 20, in May 2013, six months after Sandy. This gave city access to $1.8 billion in CDBGDR funds. The approval of an action plan in April 2015, where that vertical line is on the chart, then gave the city access to our full $4.2 billion HUD award. And the step in between there, the blue horizontal bar, is the second allocation. So to turn quickly to a spending update, the city's been reimbursed for most of the post-Sandy emergency work projects as that funding was made available soon after the disaster. The funding for the long-term infrastructure and mitigation projects was made available by the federal government more than two years after Sandy, as these projects are more complicated and the government's application and approval process consumes more time. Accordingly, spending and reimbursement for the short-term emergency work and the longer-term recovery projects have proceeded along different timelines. For FEMA, of the total $9.9 .9 billion of FEMA grants, this includes some other federal grant dollars, about $4 billion has been spent by the city, by city agencies, and over $2.2 billion has been reimbursed by FEMA to the city. For the $1.7 billion in of funding for FEMA emergency work, most of the spending has already occurred, over $1.6 billion, and reimbursements for the federal share of that spending is nearly complete complete at $1.2 billion. For the $8.2 billion in FEMA funding, including some other federal grants for long-term recovery and re resiliency permanent work, over $2.3 billion has been spent and about $1 billion has been reimbursed. The difference here between the spending that we see to date and the reimbursed amounts is the result of an inherent lag between completing a project or part of a project, attributing that funding attributing that work, attributing grant funding to that work and seeking reimbursement for that grant funding. Most of these projects are underway and many have been completed. Quickly on the HUD CDBGDR funds, of the total $4.2 billion in funding awarded to the city, the city has spent more than $2.4 billion. And within the last week, the city has been reimbursed by HUD for over 50% of the grant award, just over $2.1 billion. The city must spend all the CDBGDR funds by two upcoming deadlines. The first is January 2019, or two years from January of this year when the city signed its final grant agreement. The second is September 30th, 2022, when all of the CDBGDR funds expire by statute. HUD has given the city the authority to extend the drawdown deadline from January 2019 to September 22 for certain projects, including long-term resiliency work like Eastside Coastal Resiliency. The city is working to spend the money on HUD-funded programs as quickly as is practical and will not lose any funding because it is not spent in time. I will go further and say the city is, for all the projects that have multiple funding sources in them, the city is prioritizing the spending of the CDBGDR funding, which is on a deadline over other sources of funding. So we're spending the 
time clocked money first and other funds after. Everyone involved in the city's recovery must be careful that these projects are completed in compliance with federal and state and local requirements. This, of course, is a major task. I'm very, this is a personal aside, I'm very surprised that my public sector career has turned into, let's all follow these rules. Here's the thousand page rule book, but it has, so. Um, <laughs> the city's recovery and resiliency, you know, at the record show, yes. The city's res recovery and resiliency programs have been audited eight times by the Department of Homeland Security Office of Inspector General, seven times by the HUD OIG, and four times by the city controller. The conclusions of these audits have not resulted in a recapture of funds, a testament to the diligence and hard work being done by our great staff all across the city. Lastly, the expenditure of funding on resiliency projects and other Sandy recovery activities is regularly communicated in a public manner. Pursuant to a local law passed by this council, <coughs> authored by people in this room, OMB maintains the Sandy funding tracker. In addition, other information is available on the city's websites associated with the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency, the Build It Back <laughs> program, and at nyc.gov slash cdbg. In conclusion, though OMB has already started closing out many recovery projects, there is still more to do, like building complex flood walls to mitigate against future floods and sea level rise. We have made great strides, and we will continue to do so, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you to both, and uh, you know, I, I just want to publicly thank both of you. For th this, is, this is not easy work. This is very complicated. and. Uh, very important and timely, and I, I think uh, both of you have been invaluable resources to the City of New York, and I truly appreciate that. Um, and, and speaking of that 1,000-page rule book, uh, that, that's something that uh, this council could take pride in. We, we just passed the bill that we're waiting for the mayor to sign uh, to create a, a task force uh, to examine some of the mistakes made and crystallize the lessons learned moving forward. And one of the areas that I'm interested in trying to understand better is in the last administration, they had some very indifferent interpretation of that 1,000-page rule book than we do under the current administration. And, you know, we lost a lot of precious time that, uh, which unfortunately affected many, many, many of our New Yorkers about that. So uh, I, I, and I certainly thank you and your OM, the OMB team and staff because this is a this is a voluminous amount of work and I, I truly appreciate that and I thank uh, also um, uh, Director Zarilli and I, I just want to note I, I just yesterday I watched a, a media report uh, about the city sir report uh, this was something that was initiated by the former mayor uh, during I think the final stretch of his of his tenure as mayor of New York and I certainly appreciate the vision, but that's what pretty much was the extent of it. It was a vision. Um, there was actually no plan or mechanism in place to actualize the vision, and that was passed on to the current administration. So I, I want to publicly say, look, I, I have not been shy in pointing out flaws and challenges uh, with the current administration, but that is something that I, I think is not fair to just pass on the buck and say, uh, y now you're a mayor, deal with it. I think we have to deal with it together and, and, and come up with a plan together. Uh, but the truth is, a vision without a plan to implement it or to actualize it is just a vision. And so I, I want to just note that for the record. And uh, also, Director Zarilli, I know you were very instrumental in, in people you worked with in shaping that vision. And I, I thank you for your work. Uh, having said that, I, I would like to just, the committee would like to get just a reminder, the total cost of to implement the SIR report, to implement many of the recommendations. Do we have an, uh, an, estimate, an estimate of what that would look like to fully implement everything that was discussed, studied, and suggested in that SIR report? So thank you for those comments. And uh, again, thanks for letting us be here today to testify. The, um, that SIR report, that Plan NYC document that was released in June of 2013, uh, at the time had a price tag that was estimated at something close to $20 billion in, in the dollars of 2013. 
Now, since that time, we've secured different um, funding streams. And so we, are, we have secured over $20 billion at this point. Um, they're not the same 20. Uh, and so there's, we, we were able to be more successful in some areas. We're still seeking out and uh, working to fund additional projects in other areas. But we are advancing a very robust and probably world-leading climate adaptation program with the $20 billion we have. And the things in my testimony, what we've already gotten done, the things that are coming, uh, are absolutely making the city safer. Uh, certainly have more to do, but uh, we are committed to delivery of that $20 billion program and continuing to find new sources of funds and new ideas on how to uh, accelerate and expand that as well. But to be clear, at the time when that report was drafted and made, we didn't have all the funds in place to implement. I, is if you go back to your last slide, yeah. it, um, the last slide that you have yep. in this, it's a, there's a perfect illustration of that. Of, uh, no, no, not that one, the, the, okay. the last one. So just for well, standing point, you know, that plan was released somewhere here when only the first tranche of funds was known. We laid out a program with some assumptions on what funding might come down the pike, whether from HUD or from FEMA or the Army Corps or others. Um, there was a, um, certainly not dealing with complete information at that point on what was to come, but the vision was important around here's where we want to get to and we're going to, you know, scrap our way through whatever we need to to find a way to make it happen. But not all of the assumptions that we made on, you know, what HUD funding might come through, what FEMA funding might come through, um, not all of that materialized in the exact same way that it was assumed. And so we've continued to be creative on finding ways to fill the gap. But it's had impacts in some cases on the schedule because those big flood wall projects, the ESCR, funding wasn't, uh, you know, actually, it, was, it may have been announced by HUD in 2014. It wasn't actually available until somewhere close to 2015. So there's... There were challenges there on uh, just having the money to be able to move forward with those types of projects. And uh, I'm just, I'm not, uh, I'm not seeing Army Corps project. Is that This is just HUD, but just for illustration of what we knew at that time. Uh, the Army Corps had its own similar um, process it went through. It was awarded funds in the Sandy Supplemental, the Public Law 113-2. Um, but they were also, and so there was funds available, but they had to go through a process. They had to issue two public reports on the eligibility of certain previously authorized projects to be eligible for Sandy funds. There were a number of months and deadlines they had to meet to do that. And, and so that process led to then some choices on how they were going to be able to allocate the funds in their budget. And then there was also a longer term study, the North Atlantic Comprehensive Coast Study, that um, was authorized where they had to come back in two years and identify coastal risk from Maine to Virginia in order to identify if there are future opportunities for investment um, with Army Corps funds. And so all of this, just to make the point that there has been, you know, the money doesn't show up when the disaster shows up. And so we laid out, and I think we're, we're um, uh, helpful in laying out the vision of where we wanted to get to but the vision had to ultimately align with the funding streams that were coming, that were coming at different times much farther after the storm. Is it, is it fair to say that the majority of the recommendations in the report, which I, and just, just, just to be clear, the current administration has basically adopted that report as, their, as, 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 as part of its 1NYC vision as well, is that correct? That's correct. L largely, all, nearly all of the initiatives um, were adopted through the 1NYC program, and there's some very, very small um, differences and some things that we've accelerated and expanded in different ways and a few things that got reconsidered. But by and large, um, the vision stayed intact, and that's what's been guiding our effort. The risk analysis that went into that, um, identification of projects, the uh, the physical analysis of the threats and the opportunities to address those threats, all of that is, you know, scientifically based, was uh, uh, well formulated and stayed largely intact, and that's been guiding the, in the investments that we're still pursuing today. But h how would you characterize the majority of the recommendations in that report? Uh, would you characterize them mostly in study design phase? Would you say most of them are in, con are in construction phase? Uh, how would you characterize the majority of, of those recommendations? Well, so there were, there were 257 initiatives. Um, and so with the plus and minus, let's say we have about 250 or so things that we're doing. Um, some of them are physical projects. Uh, you know, the, the coastal defenses fall into that category. Some things are um, physical but are all about 
upgrades to existing infrastructure and you know the the money that's being invested in our public hospitals like Conan Hospital the money's being invested in uh, NYCHA falls into those categories of our upgrades of buildings then there's some non-physical things the recommendations to upgrade codes the advocacy to fix flood insurance um, uh, the flood insurance program and the flood maps there's a broad array of different things we've been very transparent every year every April we publish a progress report against the initiatives that were laid out in that 2013 report and there are plenty of things that are finished the Rockaway boardwalk I think fits into that category the T groins and Seagate fit into that the upgrades to the electrical grid the work that we've done to uh, secure funds and we're working on securing the the um, you know the telecommunications and our water supply and all the different infrastructure sectors that were laid out in that there's plenty that's done there's a lot that is still underway and there are a handful of things that are still moving through the you know the study process and let's we have to identify the feasibility we had we had to take the time to secure the funding and launch the, the work but we've been moving all of it forward we've been very transparent on the progress and um, we are much farther along than uh, certainly we were as a city when Sandy hit and it just highlights the point with knowing what's coming from climate change and the hurricane season we have plenty more to do Right, but, but some things happened after the report was made. I mean, for example, I think our, our hearing at, at, at in Coney Island about the, the public housing damage from Sandy, that was post-SIR report. So, for example, uh, I, with regards to getting permanent resilient boilers for, for our public housing stock, uh, generators on the roof, I'm not sure if that was particularly exactly all in that report originally because this happened after well, we, we definitely highlighted the need to recover in our in our public housing complexes, for example, and to right. and to do the types of things like elevating boilers and mechanical systems. Right. What is critical, and, and John can fill in some more details on this, of the the money that we were originally offered from FEMA to do that versus taking the time and getting it right and pushing them to a much higher amount of money took time, but secured more resources that we're able to invest, for instance, in NYCHA. Right. If there's more you want to add to that. Well, let me just add a couple of things here. First, this point. You know, this is the FEMA permanent work chart, and you see that, you know, in, when the SIR report came out, we didn't know what this might come to. Our original estimate for total FEMA and these other federal grants was $4.5 billion mm -hmm. in early 2013, and it remained for some time at that level. It's coming in at close to $10 billion. And that's because, you know, from the beginning, our goal has, you know, the budget director's goal, as expressed to me, is maximize our eligible FEMA funding, which is, you know, push them. And, you know, they've been actually very good in listening to eventually our arguments that their legal authorities allow us to get more funding. And what we've actually gotten, particularly in terms of hazard mitigation grant funding, which is the not just repair it to the way it was before, but to make an investment that will protect it against a future repeat of the same hazard, in this case, largely flood damages. So we've got, you know, if you look historically in FEMA disasters and the percentage of hazard mitigation grant funding to all the repair funding in a disaster, we're off the charts. And our, our total mitigation dollars across is about almost $3 billion. And uh, almost half of that is at NYCHA. You know, we worked very hard with them at NYCHA, and we got a lot of support from various people advocating, and we got a lot of needed funds. And it's also part of our participation in this 428 grant program, which gives us flexibility, but it also gave us a fast means of obligating the funds. Like, the reason why this is jumping up is because we obligated $5.9 billion worth of these 428 grants basically in a year. And it all, was all done based on cost estimates. So it was much faster than going, you know, room to room in every building, writing down, oh, this much sheetrock, this much electrical sockets, this much floor tiles. That's the sort of old way of doing it. It's, it's the painstaking way of doing it. And they get it accurate. <laughs> it's just it takes a long time. And this was much better. So we've done, a ver we've done a very good job with lots of help from participants across the city and advocating to FEMA that 
these dollars are needed and yes. going to protect. Yes, and, and I, I, I'm, on, I'm ready on record saying that, particularly when it comes to, to NYCHA recovery, um, <laughs> I think the last administration, quite frankly, just failed. Um, I, I speak from experience, speaking with, with residents in my district, and I do, I do uh, credit a lot of folks in the current administration for working hard to help us secure the historic $3 billion grant. Um, but I, the reason why I asked Director Zerilli about characterizing whether most of our recommendations and resiliency projects are in study phase, planning, design, construction, is because I think we, we understand that we're still short these, we're still short a lot of funds. Mm -hmm. We need help from Washington. But we need to be clear about how much we need or how much we think we need right now uh, to create points of advocacy. So how much do we have committed? Do you have a sense uh, to implement these resiliency projects that are laid out in the report and maybe those have been added si since, since the report? Uh, and how much are we short? And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm also including some of these Army Corps projects, which yeah. uh, also are critical to us, too, for, for a variety of reasons, which I think, I think you know why. Right. So how much do we have committed t towards them overall, and how much are we short? Well, so we have over $20 billion. That is a, that, that's the amount that, we've, um, that we have towards the initiatives that are laid out in that report. There's probably two ways to answer, you know, what's left. Like, we could identify there are some unfunded shortfalls on things that we want to get done in the near term, um, and we could do some work and, and come back with a, with a better idea of exactly what that number might be. The, the larger point here is as we're facing a change in climate, the, the threats continue to grow, and um, there's almost no amount of money that would be enough in some ways of thinking of the threats we're going to be facing from long-term sea level rise. It depends on when you want to plan out to, and you know, we, we've generally been looking at the, the 2050s for our sea level rise projections. We know what the future might hold beyond that uh, to some degree. Sea levels are going to continue to rise, of course. Um, we're investing in heat mitigation as a city. We're investing in better stormwater management. We're investing in a, a range of things um, beyond just the, the coastal storms that are coming our way. And so there's, uh, there's an incredible need for federal partnership in this. That's not the dynamic we have right now. I think the Army Corps is probably still one of the better pathways to get more investment in the types of uh, flood defenses and other things that we do need. But the dynamic with the feds, I think we've secured these funds. I don't know that we have big expectation of new dollars anytime soon, um, which is why we're doing some things to well, integrate the idea of resilience into our building code so that more things that we build have climate resiliency baked in, that well, our I, zoning I, code, our design right. guidelines, things like that so that you know, it's, it's getting away from this thinking of we're doing a resiliency project, but we're doing every project in a more resilient way. So I, I, and I, I appreciate that. I just want to get more specific. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, I think you're aware that uh, working with your office, and I, again, I appreciate the partnership, we're able to get Southern Brooklyn included right. into the broader Army Corps study, right. which, again, I am shocked that we were not included in the beginning, but that's not your fault. But I'm just saying that it was unbelievable to me that there were folks that believed that just giving us sand was sufficient. Uh, but and I thank you for, for, for helping with, with that. But at a, at a hearing that we had, we learned from the Army Corps, which I appreciate that they, they were ni nice enough to come down to the hearing, mm -hmm. that in, or, that study that we're attached to now extends to Jamaica Bay and beyond, right, right? and goes, c c goes up to actually to the bridge, to almost to Staten Island. Um, that is estimated to cost about over $4 billion to implement and the only thing they have in, in their hand right now is four hundred million. Correct. So we're short three point six billion dollars on that project alone, and that's just an initial estimate. And Mr. Grothwell knows that initial estimates are different than final costs. So we we are we're really short. That and that's an incredible. That's probably near the top of the list of of very specific project needs that we know need to be funded. The the money that is in hand is likely to be directed towards the beachfront, um, you know, and, and enhancing the beachfront along it, within that vision. The big elements, and there are big elements in Jamaica Bay itself, the inlet barrier, the connections all the way to Coney Island Creek, are a big number. We need to continue to advocate together to Washington to get that fully funded. It takes congressional action to do that. 
um, and we need to continue to raise the alarm on but that. But to be clear, your understanding is that right now we don't have the funds in place for the Coney Island Creek project. We do not have the funds in place for any element of that Rockaway reformulation project beyond the $400 million that you identified, or you know, plus or minus, but that's what the Army Corps tells us. Right, and matter of fact, I believe that they're not even finished with their final report either, which I think is due next, next year. That's correct. That we are. They they have a process to follow as well that can sometimes be maddening, and we're in the middle of that process to be able to actually get that project into the ground. All right, and I, I do want to also credit you know, your office because we've we've already started our advocacy to our federal partners. I've met with uh, Congressman Jeffries. I met with Congressman Donovan. Uh, we met with the office of Senator Schumer. We have a follow-up meeting with these offices as well uh, because, uh, quite frankly. We need to find a way to include these funds into into these into in, into a congressional bill, mm -hmm. um, and I think the point of advocacy for us is that whether you live in Texas or Florida or Puerto Rico, we're in this together. There should not be a Democrat Republican idea. This is an American priority, uh, and so this is this is a major need both in terms of physical resiliency, lives, property, but also the issue of flood insurance, which which we've talked ex extensively about. I have another question, but I'm going to. Uh, after this question, I'll, I'll turn it to my colleagues who have questions. Are, are the resiliency projects uh, for the residential and commercial properties being built in accordance with NF, NFIP standards for base flood uh, elevation? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, we have, a, you know, as, as a participant in the National Flood Insurance Program, there are requirements that we um, update and enforce code provisions, Appendix G of the building code, so those are adopted. We are building to those standards. All of the work, for instance, that Amy Peterson's doing to elevate homes and rebuild homes is meeting those newer standards for flood elevations. All the work we're doing across the city, any new permit applications that come in in the flood zone have to meet those requirements. Um, and will they be helpful to mitigate our flood insurance costs uh, in terms of those areas that are uh, seeing that resiliency work, uh, will they see their flood insurance premiums potentially decrease? So any homeowner who has a flood insurance policy, if they've um, elevated their house to those standards, um, meeting those standards is what can afford you the most affordable flood insurance. So that's the major mitigation me method that uh, FEMA will recognize in its premiums. It's you know the elevation you're at, and if you're at that standard, you're at the much more affordable level. If you're below that standard, you're more prone to flood, and the, incre the, the premiums will go up. Um, so I, th I think the short answer is yes. Um, anyone who meets those standards is able to achieve the more affordable flood insurance. Right. I, what I'm talking about, though, is that, and, and, and I've, we're in discussions with city planning about they're working on a, on a citywide, uh, you know, the zoning changes, text zoning changes mm -hmm. as far as trying to make our housing stock more resilient, and, and I fully understand that. Uh, but not everyone has the means to just elevate their house. I mean, if, if you're not going to build it back, Correct. it is a very cost, as, as we know, it's very costly to do this. Yes. And not everyone has the means to do that. And so that's why many of our communities are relying on these broader coastal resiliency right. projects to potentially mitigate these flood insurance premium costs. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, we, we are in a rush against time, not just in the sense of a physical storm hurricane, but Financially. Financially. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and to your credit, we got FEMA to go back to the drawing board to, to redo the initial maps, but eventually they'll be final. That's going to have a significant financial impact on thousands of New Yorkers who are relying on, on these coastal resiliency projects to protect them, but also to protect their, 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 their affordability. Uh, so I think some of my colleagues have questions. I'll be mindful of them. Uh, so let me, if yes. I could just in, insert, there's a, there is a really good point to be made here on, um, and the, the the Army Corps project in particular in Staten Island was proceeding on a path that was not going to be built to the FEMA standards. Um, you know, FEMA has, it's, and it's not just about the height, but there's a number of characteristics that it needs to meet. We brought them together with FEMA, got them into the room, and talked about the design characteristics that would be needed to make sure that anyone living behind that area would then benefit from the flood protection that it provides and see a, a lower insurance rate. So now that's being designed in the right way. Everywhere we can, if we have to bring federal agencies together as a city to do that, we will do that. Um, and uh, your points around the, the the varying natures of our building stock and attached homes and multifamily makes this more complicated. Um, and in where we can't elevate, 
you know, we're trying to still pursue alternative mitigation measures that FEMA will recognize for reducing flood risk and therefore reducing premiums. Um, they haven't budged too far on that just yet, but we need to continue to push that. Um, so this is very complicated, as you know. But we're, we're finding all the different ways through this to make sure we're protecting both the physical uh, resiliency of the city, but also the financial and the social resiliency as well. Yeah, FEMA needs to hire some New York City people uh, to understand uh, urban landscapes because it's been really mind-boggling to me to see all their diagrams of only it's detached homes that might be the case in parts of Nebraska or Iowa, but certainly not the case in Coney Island or Canarsie. Right. Uh, so let me turn to my colleague, Councilman Menchaca. Thank also, you, Chair. I'm joined by Councilman Richards as well. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and, and the members of this committee, and Chair, for your continued leadership on this. Uh, and I know we're, like I said, we're, we're approaching the anniversary, and so we keep everybody uh, in the city in our mind and everybody who's been impacted by natural disasters. I do want to say first uh, that I'm really impressed by these graphs. Uh, I think they tell they tell a lot about the work that's happened, and so uh, I'm a I'm a graph graphs guy. So this this is pretty impactful, and it, it brought me to a few questions, and I'm, I'm not going to take too much time, and we'll follow up later on some of the things. But this really shows that you're spending a lot of time, good time, and effort in drawing down the money, and so this kind of shows where the dollars came in, at what time, at what quarter. And and you're getting you're getting great at it. This is this is an improved effort that's happened over time with OMB and and the administration as a whole. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Director really that that there are new sources of funding that you're looking at. Can you talk to us a little bit and expand on on what those sources are beyond those that are being kind of presented by the graphs? We kind of want to get a sense about what what that looks like. So. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a few things to talk about there. One is that the city has shown its own ability to um, step up where necessary, where there's a shortfall in a project, and make sure that we can continue to advance that project. And so we've, uh, whether it was on the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project or most recently in Sunset Cove in, uh, in Queens, and, and there are other places, Staten Island as well, that we've been able to identify our own sources of funds. So that's helpful, and I think that's the dynamic that we live in with Washington right now means that we're going to perhaps need to do more of that, and uh, um, hopefully I'm not overstepping my OMB friends on saying that, but that's clearly a trend that uh, the city it has stepped up, and that's one source that is available to us at least. Um, another is making sure that we are integrating these ideas into everything we do, and so we can reduce the amount that we need to ask for if every time we do a project as a city, we're making it more resilient and we're building it into a long-term vision. And so by adopting new design guidelines, which we've done and we're test fitting right now, every time we spend a dollar as a city, we can be doing it with climate projections in mind. And whether that's our roads and drainage network or new facilities, they'll all be done in a way that is reducing future risk. Um, another big area is the Army Corps Harbor Study that's happening right now. It's evaluating really the, the next generation of potential investments that could happen in the harbor to reduce flood risk. Um, there's a number of ideas out there. They're all being evaluated. It could unlock some big dollars, but I'm not going to uh, fool anyone by saying it's going to happen quickly. The, the study we've been told is going to take another maybe five years to complete, and then there's going to be more congressional action needed. So let's not hold our breath for that, but that's at least another big source that we need to keep our eye on and, and stay diligent on. And then. Um, I mean, those are probably the biggest, the three biggest themes. Uh, John may have some other ideas that, or things that we should add to that as well. well before John, before okay, you answer, I just want to clarify a couple of things. The first, the first kind of set of of dollars and projects you pointed to, the, essentially the city kind of stepped in and filled in the void that this that the federal government wasn't able to do on some of these projects with the you, city capital budget. That's right. City, city capital budget. So that's an important thing to just clarify and correct. For everyone that's anyone that's listening, uh, or for staff, this is the capital budget of, of the city of New York, um, and then two integrating it into projects today. So these are city projects, and so I want to get a sense about mm -hmm. how much of these are, and are we measuring this work that's happening potentially with private applicants or private private public partnerships? Give me a sense about what that looks like on. So by on updating our building codes, for instance, every new building, every substantial alteration has to meet upgraded standards for flood protection in Appendix G. Um, and there's other provisions as well that are relevant. But the flood ones, I think, are um, most relevant for today. And so 
when they file their permits, they have to meet a higher level of standards. We'd have to talk to the Department of Buildings about how they actually track that, but all new buildings, and this applied for all the Build It Back, and this is applied for all the construction that's happened post-Sandy because the codes were changed in 2013. Th those have actually have already been absorbed into the marketplace, and people are using those codes uh, to make buildings more secure. And then the, the point I made around design guidelines is something that we as a city um, are testing. We released a set of preliminary design guidelines, which is meant to inform cities' capital projects. And so whether it's roads and bridges and drainage and you know new precincts or whatever they might be that happen to um, t need to take into account, whether it's sea level rise projections, coastal storm uh, uh, projections, uh, heat, or precipitation, we have laid out a set of guidelines on how to use the climate science that's available to us to make good decisions on how to upgrade our designs. We're test fitting those right now. They're, they're not final, they're not applied everywhere right now, but we're on a path to getting that finalized so that we can apply them to, the, to our uh, city's capital dollars broadly. And, and so talk, talk to us a little bit about the timeline to get to that point where we can create a mandatory um, uh, kind of guideline, mandatory guidelines for, for the city. What's, what's the timeline? So we're, w w the, the way that um, we're talking about this right now is that we are test fitting them against a, a, a set of pilot projects to understand the impacts and whether we've made good choices in how we're making these design guidelines work. Um, I think by uh, it, in sometime in next year, we'll be able to be in a place where we can say we're going to want to finalize those guidelines. And then we'll have to talk about how those are actually going to get applied through the capital budgeting process. Are any of these um, potential legal frameworks, or is this all zoning? It's it's more it's about so th 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 what it really comes down to is um, if you're designing a building right now that might be in a in a floodplain, you know we have provisions on meeting the NFIP requirements and and the Appendix G and the Building Code. But what's a little what's left a little unsaid is we want to accommodate sea level rise projections into our design, and the and the sea level rise projections have a range to them. So you, you might want to think about what's the lifespan of the asset we're talking about, how critical is it to the city, is it, a, is it a hospital or is it something that may be less important than a hospital, and we want to pick maybe the higher end of the sea level rise projection range based on the lifespan if it's more critical, maybe we can choose a lower span if, if uh, a lower end of that, that, um, that range if, if we know this asset's only going to be in place for 15 years or something like that. And so it's helping designers actually pick the number to use because right now it feels very uncertain when you're a designer and you've got all these numbers and ranges that you're dealing with. We're helping them pick the number and then we're using that to then inform the design in a way that no other city is, is doing yet. And so we're, we're, we're pioneering some new ground here to be able to figure out how to do this best. I think this is really exciting on a lot of different fronts. And I'm assuming this is all city city project only. Uh, does any of this, any guidelines that are, you, you mentioned the building code, um, Appendix G, uh, or beyond on any kind of... Uh... Well, so the design guidelines, are, we have them in mind for the city spending right now. The, the okay. building code changes apply to anybody. Right, uh, so those are private as right. well. Right, and so there may be a, a pathway to think about getting these into the code at some point, but we're, that's probably a little premature. Uh, okay. But we're also working through our climate change adaptation task force, which incorporate, which includes, I think, 58 different regional infrastructure owners across uh, across the region, the city and beyond. And we've been having conversations with them about what our climate projections say. We, I don't think we can force them to do it, but I think they've been interested in understanding how to use those kind of projections um, to better. It, um, upgrade their own assets. And so there's some been, been good dialogue there as well. Okay. John, I don't know if you wanted to... Well, I was just going to add, I mentioned that there is some additional funding that we are seeking, and it's it's largely hazard additional hazard mitigation dollars. And from my perspective, we've been working on it with FEMA for years, so it's hard for me to think of as new funding. However, it's, we hope in the next year, year and a half, to get maybe up to $400 million more largely uh, hazard mitigation grants at DEP wastewater treatment plants. But it's not new outside our existing program, particularly. So, and we're in a strange conversation where $400 million doesn't sound like a lot. <laughs> yeah, it, well, and it is, and, and like you said, we... We're glad to get it when we do. 
Good. Okay. And well, and and so, thank you for for kind of adding that that piece. I think it's telling of, of just how how many tentacles there are out there to, to draw down money as, and maximizing that. Um, but my final set of questions. I don't want to take up too much time, more time, but say that I think it's important for us to measure the city capital dollars. Um, it's important per project to do that. And so if, if we could get, if this committee could get a list of, of where the city has spent, almost an, 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 additional, uh, an additional graph, you can figure out how to, how to demonstrate that or um, visualize it. But I think it's going to be important for us to look at over time where the city has actually included capital dollars to either finish projects up, initiate new projects that were not eligible by FEMA, but I want to get a sense about where the commitment is because I think very soon we're going to come. We're going to have to, and I think we're all we've all been talking about it. Where the city is going to have to prepare for that massive capital need and gap that is here, and and so that's that's I think really important. Um, and in one case in point, in Red Hook, for example, and in Coney Island, uh, there are interim uh, flood protection measures that are being. Uh, have been implemented, and these essentially are those uh, boxes of sand. The Hesco, Hesco barriers, yeah. The, the Hesco barriers, and then the uh, uh, just-in-time... And the Tiger Dams. Tiger Dams. I'll get those next Sorry. time, I promise. <laughs> this is good. I, I, uh, I needed that. So, um, And in Red Hook, for example, only one side is taken care of, and, and the community is asking for the other side on the Atlantic Basin. Uh, the Coney Island example shows one one location that that was completely um protected because mm -hmm. it's a block the hospital is blocked and so a block unlike a community like red hook where you have certain vulnerable areas i want to know if that's a issue on funding so if that's a funding issue then that's a capital expenditure that the city can make to address that issue if the fema dollars or the um i think this was a Remind me now what the dollars. I think this is uh, CDBG funds that that brought the Hesco bags to Red Hook. So this is this is why I think it's important for us all to to be transparent about what are the barriers for us mm. to bring the barriers uh, to Red Hook, and, um, well, and and is that a capital decision? Well, and part of the answer is in the name, right? They are interim flood protection measures because yeah. we have larger things coming. This uh, is a in, phase one. In the case in the case of the hospital, there's a nearly billion dollar rebuild of the. Uh, emergency department and a brand new building at the hospital. In the case of Red Hook, of course, in your district, uh, we have a $100 million application in front of FEMA right now to elevate Beard Street to make some investments on that portion of Atlantic Basin um, that you just mentioned. So those measures are in place as a, as a temporary. Uh, they're helpful. They're not the final answer. Uh, in fact, those HESCO is where we've installed them around the city. I believe we're mostly done with city expense dollars. Um, and they were just, you know, we. I think you hit on the right point in, in how we're able to identify places to put them. Where we have discrete facilities, it's a whole lot easier um, because you can control your site in a, in a different way. The neighborhood scale improvements for those uh, barriers has been really hard to find because generally the neighborhood has more vulnerability than you can actually deal with with just the HESCO barriers, which makes the urgency on getting the full project approved by FEMA and designed and constructed. <laughs> Again, and, and I, I think the way that we are looking at it is is almost similar, but but we'll take temporary now for right. protection of course. as we as we wait for the application to get approved, without a sense about what the timeline is going to be, right. and and so we're, we're we're almost at the end of this season. We'd like to see some demonstration of that temporary um, with city expense. Again, this is the gap. So right. this is part of the the filling of the gap and understanding what the gap is, right. and are we over time looking at the past, seeing that actual commitment from the city come in when, when it's needed. And I think this is needed, so I'm, I'm advocating for that. So anyway, I think if we can figure out some, some ways to, to visualize this a little bit and, and understand that gap and where the city is going to have to come in with capital resources and expense dollars. Great. I think we can follow up with that. Uh, thank you, Council Member. I just wanted just to, just to hone in on, on some of this. Uh, it's my understanding that the city actually has to put up some capital dollars on some of these projects. Say, for example, with the Staten Island Army Corps project, there had to be a federal uh, portion, mm -hmm. there had to be a New York State portion, 
and it has to be a New York City portion. Is that correct? That is correct on that project. And the, the Army Corps process had gotten complicated because in that, when I described those two reports that they had to give to Congress on how what projects were eligible, they deemed some projects eligible that didn't need a local match. And in the case of Rockaway, the, the peninsula, that's a project that when that gets um, ultimately to, con to be constructed, does not require a local match. Incredibly important to know that distinction because we should be maximizing that project um, because we can maximize the federal contribution without hitting the city's budget. In the case of Staten Island, for some arcane bureaucratic reasons, it fell into a bucket of it, it's a project that was, had been moving forward, but it needed local match. And so in that case, we had to put um, about $60 million on the table in the capital budget. The state has more recently uh, allocated uh, its portion of the local share, and the, and the federal government is doing its. Um, and there was a very particular clause in, the, in Public Law 113-2, the Sandy Supplemental, that said we could not use CDBG for local match for Army Corps projects. But it turns out you could use CDBG for local match for FEMA projects. And so every one of these things got very difficult and complicated to be able to navigate this. Um, and I'm sort of going back in time and still sweating over all of what happened in the last four years on figuring all this out. It, um, we've, to John's point, we've maximized the federal dollars everywhere we could. And some places where we, because of statute, could not do that, we've had to step in to make sure those projects could happen. Right. And, and just to reiterate uh, the point is that when the announcement happened in Staten Island, which I think they absolutely do need, and I credit all the Staten, your office and, and, and the Staten Island officials uh, for getting that done, you have to understand that folks from southern Brooklyn say, Where, what's the plan for us? Yep. Not just my district. Yep. I hear from people in Manhattan Beach, Sheepside sure. Bay, Gerritsen Beach, you know, Canarsie, uh, you know, and they say, what's our plan? And so I, when I tell people that we had to get ourselves included into a study first, yep. it's – we're, we're at step one. This Staten Island study was on the books for, for a number of years, if I'm not 1993. mistaken. 1993. 1993. And it took them <laughs> several decades. The Rockaway Project was authorized in 1965, I believe. I mean, these things were way too long so, to get implemented. So that's why it, 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 is, it is a complete so shock to me that there was nothing in the works all this time for areas that every, you know, I, I, I'll never forget when I was still teaching. Mayor Bloomberg and others, and even before, would say, be ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. And all these brochures, beautiful magazines, be ready, get ready. Meanwhile, there was nothing being studied uh, to, to protect us. And, and it was just unreal that, and again, I, I want to thank you for getting us even in, in, into, the, into the realm of the study. But even my colleague, I, I see Councilman Margaret Chin, we've been joined by her, also Councilman Eric, uh, Eric Ulrich is here. Uh, you know, Residents from her district also speak to me, speak to her, I'm sure, every day about you know, the, the big U project, which is not really funded to be a U at this point. It's more like a J or half a J, I, I've, I've shared with some, with some people. So I've heard. Uh, so I've heard. Um, <laughs> well, look, when people ask me, uh, are we funded, fully funded for these, for these visions, we're not. And we have to be honest with people. And I'm not saying that this is uh, squarely on the, on the foot of the city. Uh, but There's a really important point here. I think in, in your 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 bringing me to think of this, um, when Sandy hit, this city had zero coastal protections. The, the, the prior thought on the work with the Army Corps was only ever really about recreational beaches. And sand also then had a benefit in, in storms, of course, but it was primarily about the recreational beaches. Only three projects were ever were really authorized in a substance, which was the Staten Island Project from 1993, the Rockaway Project in Jamaica Bay from 1965, I believe, um, and the Coney Island, which only ever resulted in sand and the sea groins to be able to protect the sand. That's all we had even in front of us that was possible. And so the city stepped up and said, we've got to do something about this. We need to push those projects that are on the books because they're at least a pathway to getting something done. And we've finished one. We've got two more still to go um, because of the Army Corps process. We've stepped up and said, we're going to do some of this on our own, like we have with the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, like the projects we've pushed forward in Red Hook. The most vulnerable communities need the investment first, and we've turned from having nothing planned at zero out in the field to actually having things finished. And the Rockaway Boardwalk's a great example of that, and we need more of that to come across the city. But this is something the city had never seen as its responsibility before, and Sandy changed our mind and said, we need to step into this and not just rely on others to take care of this for us because what we saw with the Army Corps is 
it didn't get the projects done unless we were continuing to push them. Just we need to do more. But of to that. your point, Director Zerilli, when residents rightfully ask, "When will my neighborhood be better protected?" Yep. Uh, it's not uh, a point of confidence to tell them that Rockaway had to wait until, since 1965. No, it is not. To get to this point, or Staten Island from 1993. They want to be alive to uh, see, you know, their neighborhoods protected and, and also to maintain affordability. But I just I just want to just hone in, uh, again, Menchaca's point that was very well taken about the city does have to budget for some of these projects that might require us to put up money too. And the state has to put up money, which is not always an easy thing either. Uh, but and, and you mentioned the hazard mitigation funds. If I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, that goes through the state. It does. And that does not mean it goes to New York City automatically. Am I correct? And we're competing with other parts of New York to get to get those funds. Is that well, right? Well, there's a first set of hazard mitigation funds are tied to damaged facilities. Right. There's another one, which is the one you're talking about. Right. But the one I was talking about were tied to these, the damaged wastewater treatment plants okay. are eligible for it directly because of the sandy damage. Right. 406 mitigation. Yeah, 406 mitigation. So what you're what, and what you're referencing is the hazard mitigation grant program. The right. 404? 404. Get all my statute numbers right again. Um, which, as you're, you're absolutely correct, is discretion, discretionary by the state on how they allocate those. Um, and so a lot of that money got spent upstate, and um, uh, we've gotten some of those dollars. We certainly would welcome more. Right, we need more. Uh, all right, Councilman Richards. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for holding this hearing. And first, I want to commend uh, the administration on a few new victories and I know we're breaking ground on Redfern houses tomorrow which I'm very happy about the boardwalk and obviously we still have work to do on build it back I think call uh, council member Menchaca stole my thunder a little bit uh, on you know the importance of figuring out ways to uh, fill these gaps that may come um, I guess the question I would ask is are you confident in four years at least for Rockaway, that the Army Corps is really serious about uh, putting protective measures in place. Um, I know so they've spoken about money. We did a tour a few weeks ago with the Army Corps uh, and state DEC and, and your office. Uh, so in light of what's going on around the country with Texas and uh, Florida, are we confident that this administration is serious about actually getting projects off the ground here? Well. I can't speak for the federal government, obviously, but we are pushing. Have you got that indication? We have got no indication that there's a problem with the projects, and so okay. at least the lack of a negative. Um, okay. You know, the project teams at the Army Corps are pushing forward. And these they, are the same teams are, that were here under the Obama yeah, administration, that's right. it's so it's pretty much staff. still the same right. staff. Okay. Um, and you know, along those lines, the uh, the projects are still moving forward. The Army Corps, because of congressional rules, ties itself in knots on process. Um, they're still moving forward in that process to get to the construction, but it's just, it's taking longer than anyone would ever want it, how long it would we would want it to take. And then uh, I know there was leftover boardwalk money. Uh, where are we at with that? Um, and what is the so total? We had been a, in a process with the community to allocate um, those dollars. Uh, we had submitted a How much set again? Of, 100? There was about $120 million mm -hmm. that we had mm -hmm. identified that were um, saved from the construction of the boardwalk that about two years ago the mayor had made a strong commitment to keeping that money in the Rockaways for further mitigation projects. We uh, had undergone, uh, and with your office, of course, um, a prioritization of the types of needs that are mm -hmm. necessary to, to pr provide additional mitigation uh, on the Rockaway Peninsula. And we had submitted those projects for approval to FEMA. And so and have we, we, got are, any, uh, we, are, we are waiting to, to finalize all of that now. Okay. And then I'll, I'll just speak on my last question is just on uh, basic infrastructure. And this is something the city could focus on that we don't have to wait on the feds for. I'm very appreciative of $1.7 billion the mayor has given uh, to Southern Queens to really address the longstanding flooding issues. But you know, the needs are continuous, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know if you're in conversation with DEP, but for communities like Arvin, and I'm sure uh, there are communities in Brooklyn as well, and I know Councilmember Orish probably shares, uh, we share boundaries uh, that, that are very close that uh, also have uh, these specific issues that are going on where there's just no infrastructure in place. So even as we wait for a longer term Army Corps project yeah, to happen, you know, without basic infrastructure where water can go, 
uh, for areas like Auburn, you know, we can wait 20 years for Army. Well, we can't wait 20 years. We, I, I'm just not confident in much in the Army Corps. But for things the city can uh, do uh, in many of these areas, like prioritizing just the basic infrastructure needs, I think it's going to be critical as we move uh, forward, too. And when you talk about just giving communities basic hope mm -hmm. that something is going to come down the line, you know, we got some paving done a few weeks ago, which was in itself, I mean, in the past 15 years, at least that I've been here, the streets have never been repaved. So that's given some hope. But at the end of the day, you know, when it rains, the, their, their streets are still flooded. So... I'm hoping that the administration is going to really look at these areas that were hit hard uh, during Hurricane Sandy and areas that weren't hit hard by Hurricane mm -hmm. Sandy as well, but prioritizing many of these areas because they have gone through, you know, uh, a devastation already. Right. So, well, so I mean, we're happy to work with your office if there are particular locations and to um, talk with DEP as well about their plans. They've made some improvements to drainage in different parts of the coastal areas around the city. Um, and so, I mean, we have to talk to them about their plans and their funding streams to be able to, to do more. We'd be happy to engage with you on those. Yeah, and I think you, yep. I mean, this is, if you streamline and work together and prioritize, I think we can get it done. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Richards. Um, and next we have Councilman Perkins. Uh, thank you. Public housing. Uh, how, how vulnerable uh, are public housing developments, especially those that around like the East River and places like Hudson to this type of flooding and resiliency issues? So I think, I mean, probably part of the answer there is what happened during Sandy, right? And we saw public housing that was devastated during Hurricane Sandy. And when the power went out and when the, the boilers went out, we, we faced a lot of challenges, which is why it's been so important that we did secure the, the $3 billion and we're investing that to be able to make those uh, developments safer. We know in East Harlem that there is a, um, there is a fairly extensive floodplain, um, and so there are risks for public housing. There's risks for all the building stock as well in, uh, in, in East Harlem. But this is really this is also a five borough problem, and all of our coastal neighborhoods face vulnerability. So, what are we doing to fix that problem? I mean, are we working on preventing what might be inevitable? Otherwise, so two things, I guess. One is that we are working with the Parks Department on an analysis of flood protection on the East River itself in East Harlem, and we have to get into that process to see if there are some feasible options there. And uh, I, don't, I think we'd have to follow up with you on specific public housing developments within that $3 billion grant, unless you know the, the specifics there. I don't have them off the top of my head, but we do know, you know, the dollar of grant, FEMA grant to be spent repairing damages, the dollar value of the FEMA grant for mitigation at that particular development. So we're not only repairing, but we're putting in that when you say that particular development you're only looking at one development which one is that do you have well no, any particular development oh, any there's, there's 33 across the city yeah there's yeah. 33 we have the dollar values for both pieces on all of them i read off earlier it was something less than three billion dollars half of its mitigation roughly do you, do you do you know do you have a list of the sort of developments that yes that, could you make sure that we get a copy yep. so we can get a sense of uh, which ones are being targeted, and maybe there are others that may, we have decided may not need it, but at least we'll understand. Yeah, these are all the ones. These are all the FEMA funds are going to the developments that had significant damages from Sandy. So it doesn't mean there aren't other ones that are vulnerable because they're in the floodplain. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm but saying. Yeah, I want to yeah. know the, the ones that have been identified to get and the ones that may also be vulnerable that may not have been... Okay. Uh, victimized yet, but right. nevertheless. So, so we, uh, I think our, our specific knowledge may run uh, may run dry pretty quickly on this, but I think our our friends at NYCHA uh, can help us answer these questions. Okay, the, the, it would be helpful to find out as soon as possible because there, you know there's a, there's always a, a concern about something like this happening that comes up when you go to a tenant meeting <laughs> and they've had that experience or they they know somebody. Right. in the vicinity that's going through that experience. So uh, right now you're saying there is some, what are, you, what are you saying, there's something moving in that direction? So there's definitely 
um, mitigation measures at the 33 developments across the city. What we need to follow up with you on is what what's happening uh, in East Harlem or in your district. Yeah, the East Harlem, Harlem area. Yeah. And uh, sort of the Washington Heights area. So we can follow up with you on that um, uh, once we have that information. Yeah, I mean, I think I might shed some clarity on this. My, my knowledge is that, and Mr. Rethwell, feel free to chime in. You've been dealing with FEMA quite a bit as well, is that the way they work is that there had, there ha there, there had to have been damage done to the property in order for us to get resources. Now, obviously, Councilmember Perkins, you're, you're speaking to about uh, being responsible and planning ahead responsibly proactive. and uh, and being proactive, which I, unfortunately, sometimes the government fails fails to, to take into account. The way the program uh, works is that damage had to be done to your uh, 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 build. For example, I have about 10, I have 10 ITRA developments in my district, nine of which were damaged by Sandy. Marlboro Houses was really not to the extent that Coney Island Houses were. And so when they are, when, when we're talking about new boilers and new roofs for the Coney Island part, you know, I had to explain to them that they were not severely damaged by, by Hurricane Sandy. Uh, but yes, I, the point Councilman Perkins is making is very valid, that in order for us to plan responsibly, we should anticipate uh, damage done, done to our housing stock well beyond just the scope of where Sandy affected us. Let me just also mention, yes. you know, w w generally, uh, lately, where, where there has been like, uh, let's say a proliferation of public housing, integrated into that has been uh, private uh, housing as well. And some of those sites, you know, with, where there was uh, open space, private developers may have come in and developed a co-op in the vicinity or nevertheless, um, they were along the same coastal line, so to speak. So I'm not just simply talking about public housing, I'm just saying right. those areas right. Uh, where there's public housing and there's that uh, possibility, there's also non-public housing. Right. So it's not right. just uh, one type of housing all the time. I do have a. a I think we need yeah. to give, give 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 some attention to what the threat might be, if at, if at all, or yeah. what mitigating factors are being taken. I do have a question, uh, just to follow up with regards to, to NYCHA. I know that. As you mentioned, 33 developments are, are, are in line to, or are in process of now getting these funds. Uh, would you know from an OMB standpoint, does, at a previous hearing, I learned that NYCHA pays insurance to over 20 companies, which was news to me. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, and I'm wondering that with all these resiliency measures that we're implementing in these NYCHA buildings, uh, is NYCHA now required to purchase flood insurance? Do we have flood insurance on those on those buildings? And with these resiliency measures, would that mitigate those costs to some extent? Well, I don't know about the specific answer to your question. I do know, I have, I'm generally familiar that NYCHA has a, both an NFIP insurance program and a pollution liability insurance program. So they already had required insurance prior to this disaster. Okay. So the FEMA funds do come with it a require to get insurance. You know, NYCHA already had insurance or, and are continuing their policies. And um, as far as all the rest of the city facilities that are being repaired with FEMA funds that are hit with the insurance requirement, there are certain types of assets that do not have an insurance requirement because they're not insurable assets. For example, the sand on a beach or a boardwalk. There are a variety of, the, of what we think of as city infrastructure, which there's no insurance market for, so they're deemed non-insurable. But we have insurance now on all the city facilities that have the insurance requirement because it's a condition of the grant. And we had been living in a pre-disaster world where we, you know, if something breaks or we repair it with the capital program as part of maintenance or we build something new, but we thought of ourselves as self-insured, when in reality that's, if you're a large city like us or a large state even, you can perhaps think you're self-insured, but the insurance industry calls you uninsured. We now have insurance. FEMA no is aware that we have insurance. Normally this insurance requirement comes in when you're closing out a grant. We just did it because something might happen again, and we do not want to disqualify any of our facilities that are under the process of being repaired 
from getting additional FEMA funding if something occurs while we're in the process of repairing it. So, but Mr. Rappel, are you, do you know if the city has recouped all the funds it believes it deserves from insurance companies uh, from uh, from the Sandy damage? Well, the I believe that NYCHA is in an ongoing litigation with their insurance company regarding a settlement of a insurance claim, and I don't believe that's resolved, or at least I'm not aware of it's being resolved. And do you know what they're suing for? Uh, they're suing for the full value of all their insurance. And what policies. was the, do you have the amount with you? In the $400 million range, and I believe they've gotten a significant portion of that. Those are your resiliency plans for East Harlem, uh, Councilmember Perkins. Thank you for erasing it. Yeah. <laughs> What that, d what that does, though, when they get a insurance recoupment from their insurance company, FEMA lowers the amount they will pay you for repairs by that insurance recoupment. So it's a good idea to have insurance. So they went to your company. But there's no, you know, it's not money out of pocket for something new. Right. Uh, okay, so, so my other colleagues have questions. I want to turn to Councilman Eric Ulrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for your testimony today. I want to uh, reiterate my thanks to the administration for their substantial investment in Sunset Cove. I was very pleased to join uh, you, Mr. Zerilli, along with Deputy Mayor Alicia Glenn, uh, to make sure that that project is going to be fully funded and get the shovel in the ground soon. So for my broad channel uh, constituents that worked very hard on that, I want to say thank you again. All right, thank you. Um, I want to talk about sand on the beach. I don't know if we have an update. We had a hearing many months ago, a little bit of an exchange between us and the Parks Department regarding the 90-day survey. What is the status of the 90-day survey, and what is the status of sand getting pumped on the beach in uh, Rockway Park downtown into Donovan Richards District and the uh, beach 20s and 30s, and uh, also uptown in Bell Harbor? This was uh, focus of the last hearing, but I want to see if you have an update. Right. So, I mean, the update is uh, we have some preliminary results that we're reviewing right now uh, for that survey. We're doing some due diligence to make sure that we, we know everything we need to know on uh, what we're seeing. Uh, there's definitely some hot spots. You know, in some cases it, it may look worse than it actually is, but there's definitely some erosion happening. And sand is a very, you know, the coastal environment is very dynamic. Sand shifts all the time. And so we're, we're trying to understand is it, a healthy normal shifting or is it washing offshore and and we're losing it off the beach but in those particular hot spots there's definitely a, uh, a lesser beach than there was still better than when sandy hit and yet there's still less sand than we would want there so we're we're doing the due diligence on the analysis i think we'll have some some more public things to say once we're convinced on what we're seeing in the analysis and we'll definitely want to come and talk so to you about that when soon. when and it's kind of unfair because parks isn't here but when or about when did we actually start that 90-day survey and is it completed is the 90 days over and then when you say the yeah so i'm not sure about 90 days specifically but i know that we have preliminary results um we probably need a couple more weeks just to do the due diligence before we can come back with a an idea on what exactly we're seeing and then that's going to need to turn into, well, what can we do about it? And then we have to do some work on that as well. I think the sooner we can get sand pumped on the beach, the better. The better. We're at the five-year anniversary of Hurricane Sandy, and I have constituents that, you know, they, they just feel like they're, they're still at risk, and they are. You know, they definitely are because they live next to the ocean or on the bay, and they're concerned about the erosion and the rising sea levels and all the things that we're talking about today. That's right. Last uh, question I have, I don't know if it was addressed already, Mr. Chair, uh, regarding the CDBG DR and the NDR funding. Um, according to the council fact sheet here, it says it includes $478.2 million in expenses in the other activity category. What is that for? What does other mean? What, what, it's almost a half a billion dollars, $478.2 million for expenses in the quote unquote other activity category. I guess we're trying to find out what precisely does other activity consist of. I'm not sure what you're looking at. Do you, do you know the answer to that? I do know the answer uh, to that. It's in this uh, resiliency list chart that we have. <coughs> yeah, it says it says in the in the legend down here. Let me just other activity <coughs> covers planning, administration, 100% of CDBGDR activities not tied to construction. Funds will be used to match for certain FEMA emergency works projects. I'm just wondering if we have a breakdown of that. And I mean, half a billion dollars is a lot of money. I just 
Well, well we can give you a breakdown of that. Um, it's basically non-construction programs funded by this grant across a wide variety of, you know, the, you know, we presented materials to the staff of this committee for large construction projects because this was focused on, you know, what is the status of the large construction projects for recovery and resilience. So, so a lot of these other um, programs funded by HUD that were not large construction, we just put into another activity category and put it on one line and we can give you detail on that, but that's basically what it is. Okay, well maybe for the next we're hearing to, or well, we're happy to we're happy to give it to you, you know. They could send tomorrow. it to the chair and the members of the committee yeah. just so that we uh, we have a better sure, understanding sure, of what sure. what the other other activities actually yep. consist of in, in actuality. Mm -hmm. uh, last question I have is um, to piggyback off of Councilmember Richards' question about the money that was left over for the boardwalk. I know that we you've had extensive meetings with the community board. 14 and uh, talking to some of the other elected officials. When do you think, the question is not what projects will be funded by that money, but when do we expect to have an announcement on that by the administration and, and a breakdown by agency how we're going to spend that, the remaining money? Right, so the, um, the 120 million or so that was remaining, the public process you, you uh, referenced identified priorities. I think there were seven project priorities that then we packaged up had to submit through the state to FEMA. Um, we hope to hear the answer soon and be able to actually um, uh, say some more official things very soon. Okay. I want to thank you again uh, for the testimony. I apologize for being late. I was attending a wake earlier today, and I'll uh, give my yield my time back to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. You got it, Councilman Elrich. And again, to your credit, you have been very steadfast, persistent, consistent on, on fighting for your community, and so I want to want to publicly uh, credit you for that. Um, also, next uh, question we have from Councilman Margaret Chin. Thank you, Chair. It's a busy day today with so many hearings. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't want to miss this one again, no. all right, because I do have a couple of questions. Um, Lower Manhattan. Big huge. All right. <laughs> I don't know where the U is going to end, uh, but you know, Low Manhattan members has been advocating and advocating, and we, we got some money from the city capital, you right. know, the, the 100 million, and uh, all the, I see your staff team and all the town, you know, all the meetings that we've been having, and we've seen some plans about the seaport, and of course, we see plans from Barry Park City Authority. Um, they're moving at a much quicker pace, and so we're concerned about, you know, the, the, really a formation of a comprehensive plan for low Manhattan. I mean, how, how is low Manhattan going to be, you know, protected? You know, because we, there were funding for battery and then we got an extra hundred. Uh, it's, it's five years later and, you know, we're surrounded by water. Um, so I think that's community really want to have a, a more update on like, how do we get this project moving forward? Right. And my question is that also, I remember those pictures, you know, like, okay, the barriers, how high, and, and I was at a, a recently at a, a boat ride that toured all of uh, Lower Manhattan. I thought it was very interesting talking about storm searches, you know, how do we kind of help, you know, prevent those further out, um, and what could we do to protect um, the waterfront without having to have those big, tall barriers, it was, it was all possible. I mean, that's what, you know, the community is looking at, you know, where are the protection? You know, there's been a lot of meetings, um, and then we've been advocating for more funding, but when is, when will the com community see something concrete? <clears throat> so the, the rebuild by design process that led to the, the big U, the, um, did not set great expectations because it put some really big pictures out there from 42nd Street all the way to West 57th Street and like and so we had been prioritized on some of the highest vulnerability areas uh, in Lower Manhattan which is why we put forward the plans we did for the three major components the East Side Coastal Resiliency from 26th Street to Montgomery Street from Montgomery to the Brooklyn Bridge the two bridges component and then south of Brooklyn Bridge to the north end of Battery Park City um, 
for a variety of reasons, uh, the federal government was willing to invest in the two northern components, uh, largely because of the housing components there and the affordable housing and public housing um, uh, stock that, that exists there. We secured $335 million for ESCR. That's a project where we put additional money in, and it's now a $760 million total project that is moving towards construction. Um, we think early 2019, we're trying to pull that forward as much as possible and get that into the ground quickly. The two bridges component, also with housing, attracted some additional HUD dollars as well, $176 million. Uh, we've also put some additional city capital on the table to be able to continue that project. What didn't attract any federal dollars at all um, was further south. So the city knows it had to step up. We have put $108 million in the budget. It's not enough for a full project, uh, but we're due. And, and the other complication is it's probably the, the most complex area to develop coastal protection uh, in, any, in the city. The underground infrastructure, the density of the real estate, all of that just makes it complicated, which is why we're uh, undertaking with the money we have the meetings you've been to, the work with the business community, the work with uh, residents in Lower Manhattan to identify how to do this in, in a smart way. We've been working with Battery Park City Authority and integrating what they're doing so that it will match up with ours. And in some cases, I think they actually raised the height of their protection, the design levels of their protection to match what we're planning to do. Um, we w I, th I think we're, where we may be heading is finding a way to, to invest what we have now mm -hmm. in something more tangible earlier while some bigger things uh, still develop through the planning and design phase. Um, we don't have an answer on when we might be building something in Lower Manhattan, unfortunately, because it's of the complexity and the fact that the federal government did not want to invest there. It chose to put its money further north. So those projects are moving uh, more quickly, but we're focused in, on finding any, any way possible to move those as long. And the first step of that, of course, is to uh, really pin down what those designs look like so that we can price them and so that we can find the, w the right way to fund them. You know, because, you know, there are a lot of, um, you know, private buildings down in tips of Lower Manhattan, and I see all these, like, these, these holes that's punched on the sidewall. Right. I mean, every building is, like, they're protecting themselves. Sure. But if the water comes in, you're, you're protected. But what about the building next door that don't have the resources? Where is the water going to flow? I mean, that is similar to what's going on in public housing. I'm glad to see, you know, the money uh, coming, um, you know, for the development in my district that were damaged. And they're going to put generators on the roof so they have to fix the, the old roof because it's dilapidated. And the idea is to put the generator up there so that they can still run electricity and run the elevator and all sounds great. And then you have building that they're gonna do the, the barriers, you know, to protect the water from coming into the building. But for some reason, they say, well, this building is protected, but the next one that was also flooded, maybe not as much and not as close to the, the water, uh, didn't have that uh, barrier. So, I mean, the, the, the tenants there are organizing a task force and we're, we're working um, with FEMA and, and just try to get a better grasp of how do you protect everybody um, to make sure that the water, you know, protected from one building don't damage another building. Uh, so those things are, are happening in, in, in two of my uh, development. But I think people want to see something concrete done because it's five years. And we want to see that, look, all these plan and all these meetings people are going to, something, you know, well, something's got to start. Well, and it, and it yeah. will, and it will first start on the, on the Lower East Side project. That is absolutely the first project where we will get into the ground. We think we will get in the ground after that on two bridges. But the complexity of the further southern portion, it, we still have more work to do, and that's just the honest answer. There have been plenty of upgrades. The, the power grid is, is better protected. You know, we, we could talk about what the MTA is doing. And so there's plenty of things that have happened to upgrade the flood protections in different ways in lower Manhattan. But the edge protections that are necessary, we're still working through the complexity uh, to be able to achieve that. I mean, like, for the federal funding, are there – are they reporting that you have to do um, on a regular basis, and can those be available so people know, could be able to track um, the progress? So the reporting that we do to the feds, I mean, there's plenty of audits. There's, there might be more. We do uh, quarterly reporting on the, Sandy fun on the Sandy funding tracker, which shows, you know, progress in terms of the funding. If you look at 
progress, you know, dollars spent. Or well, what about the resiliency projects? Well, in terms the ones of all this, like the, all this different part of money, and mm -hmm. you know, how did like how does someone sort of like keep track? Even for for me, it's hard to keep track of like how mm -hmm. much is you know for this part of my district, how much is that part of my district? <laughs> Things that are you know happening here and there, and there are, there are active you know community member who want to be engaged. So they do come to um, you know those community meeting and they wanted to participate, but it would be good for them to be able to get regular information, and also see that the updates of that that progress are being made, right? Um, and also what are some of the difficulties so that the people can sort of understand that and not be so frustrated, right? By well, not so the, having the information. So there are there are, there's a project <laughs> website for the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, for instance, and so we could direct people there. Um, there's also a uh, mapping tool that we have on the city's website that shows the progress on nearly a thousand projects and where they are in the process. There's the Sandy Tracker website as well. So it's a, there are a couple different sources which could make it complex, um, <laughs> but there is information online that we'd be happy to point you to and you can share with your um, with your constituents. Yeah, somewhere to like streamline it so that people can access the information without having to physically click on or, or look for so many websites. And I think that regular, you know, reporting to the community board and and just to kind of keep people abreast of what's going on. That that work is being done. Yep. You might not see it. I mean, same thing with the World Trade Center development or in the early days. Yep. People didn't see anything above ground, but they didn't know that there were stuff happening underground that you have to build a strong infrastructure. So here, I mean, if there's a similar situation, then the public should know. And in this way, they, they won't be so frustrated, and, and then we get the frustration. Right, right. Well, happy to work with you to share that information. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councilmember. And I think you know, your line of questioning leads me to, to my, my next question is about uh, the, the advocacy efforts uh, of, of the administration to encourage Washington um, to really give us this needed funding. Um, can you share with us the most recent conversations or wh who have you had those talks with um, uh, and where are we at in terms of trying to make progress from our federal partners uh, to get these funds to complete, to go from a, a J to a U and over in, in Manhattan and to get us more than sand in Coney Island? Uh, where are we at? Well, so we, I mean, we have a very robust federal advocacy program, and um, I think it's been incredibly helpful that you were able to, to step in and organize the conversation in your district and with uh, Senator Schumer, who's been a great friend to the city on yes. all things recovery and resiliency. Um, we want to continue to help support that, and we talk to our delegation uh, regularly on any number of issues, including these issues of resiliency and flood insurance and all the things that we need out of Washington. So they continue. There's lots of interaction. Uh, we welcome your leadership in helping to continue to push that as well and want to support that in any which way we can in order to get these big projects funded. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to note for the record that, uh, you know, I was just interviewed recently by uh, a, a television affiliate from Houston. Uh, they came out here to, to kind of discuss you know, lessons learned from us here to share with them. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, you know, our, definitely our, our hearts are with them. Our prayers are with them. That they're going through quite a bit. Fifty inches of rain is is, is it's no joke. It, it is absolutely uh, incredible what's happening. Um, but you know, I want to I want to note that when when Texas needed New York, New York was there for Texas, and some elected officials from Texas were not there for New York when we needed them. Uh, Senator Cruz, for for example, um, and that's why this should not be a political issue. Th this is a real serious issue. And my conversations with Congressman Donovan. I express that he happens to be in the majority in, in Congress and in, in the House. This should not be political. I actually, I, I'm willing, if, if the city has interest, to, to meet with our partners, our federal delegation partners from here, from Texas and others, to, to, to discuss lessons learned, but to say we need to advocate together now to help you recover, but to help us be more resilient moving forward. This, this needs to be a top priority because, again, a lot of conversations, meaningful conversations around climate change and the fact 100%, very valid, very real, but we still have a long way to go here. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and that's why we, we need to double down, triple down on these advocacy efforts to get us into the pipeline. I, I, I think one point of advocacy uh, is the infrastructure bill that we've been waiting to be crafted in the House. Uh, I think we have to be all over that bill. 
And this is infrastructure, this is resiliency, this is, this is a lot. But that could help for Manhattan, that could help for us in Brooklyn and Queens and, and all of our Im vulnerable impacted boroughs. Um, I, I want to just also just, just note, you had mentioned, uh, Mr. Grathwell, that there's a deadline for us to draw down these funds that has, uh, to September 2022, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Is this unprecedented that we are given a deadline to draw down funds, or is this the case in all disaster recovery efforts? Well, first off, this is just HUD funding. Oh, HUD, okay. And in FEMA funding, there is no deadline, which I wouldn't take it literally. There's no stated deadline, but in the FEMA world, after a certain amount of time, they want to close out the disaster, and if you ha which they did at the end of 2015 for 9-11. You know, not quite. I guess it was it was 2016, so 15 years later, um, it's not officially a deadline. But in the HUD world, yes, there is a deadline, and it is that standard. Yeah, it no, it's un, it's it's for this disaster. They've never applied a deadline before for CDBG DR funds. There was no deadline in Katrina, for instance. Right. So it was it was a new creation for the Sandy Supplemental to put that deadline in there. And it was in some ways a reaction to what happened in Katrina. Of course, people tend to pendulum swing back and forth rather than finding a happy medium. But we're going to live with it, and we're going to spend our HUD dollars first. And you know this. Well, you know, because the point I'm making here is that I, I, I feel that you know we need as much time as we need to get this done right. Uh, as far as obviously expeditiously, but to get it done right. Uh, you know, the, the president uh, in, in his tweet says Texas, Florida will be with you for as long as we have to, which I think is right. And then he says to Puerto Rico, we, we can't be there forever, which is outrageous. Uh, but, you know, for here, we want to make sure that we get this done right, you know, right. and, and you know, get it done the right way. Right. So uh, we, we share yeah. that. I mean, the, the deadline is unprecedented and unhelpful, but we are continuing to move with every urgency to get these done. We don't, we don't want necessarily you know, forever deadlines because we don't want to get the work done. We want to get the work done as quickly as possible. I, I, and, I, and we can't depend upon we can't depend upon a possible option of an extension of a deadline that might not occur. So correct. We're moving forward with all reasonable speed. Uh, correct. And, and might I add, with many of, of these projects, are there maintenance agreements that the federal government is asking us to enter into uh, to discuss how do you maintain them? Because, for example, if you build a floodgate, once it's built, who covers the cost of maintenance? So w we expect that the city, you know, for the for the HUD funded ones, that will be city owned infrastructure. That'll be city operated infrastructure. Um, the Army Corps has a, a more formal process of transferring the responsibility to the local partner to operate new flood. That the state or the city? Um, so we expect that w it would be the city in the case of the Army Corps projects. So. If something happens to a floodgate, the city has to pay to fix it. Is that correct? Uh, it would be owned and operated by the city at that point. Are there warranties on these things where if something happens in the first five years, the feds pay for it, or once it's built, now it's the city's problem and that or city's issue? It's and a that's good question, and the fact that I don't know the answer to that highlights the fact that we don't have any actual coastal infrastructure from the Army Corps operating in the city right now. Um, so we can check with you on uh, or check back and, and get back to you on the warranty sort of questions. Because these are big budget questions, because I'm sure there's not going to be cheap maintenance. Is that yeah, correct, uh, Director? That Crawford? is correct. But And there have been discussions. But like you mentioned in some of your earlier remarks, that we need to think of these resiliency investments as a new public good. Oh, and, I agree. And, and if we are making these investments, there will certainly be operation and maintenance costs like there is when you build a new park, like there is when you expand a wastewater treatment facility. but. If we want to protect the very expensive wastewater treatment facility, some expenditure on increased maintenance of the flood protection system might be considered a very good investment. Right, because they, if we're saying that the estimates to complete everything is in the billions of dollars, the maintenance of them cannot be that far behind. Uh, Director Zero, you mentioned before the Climate Change Adaptation Task Force. Uh, we passed a bill which the mayor signed uh, my bill, actually, uh, about communication resiliency. Telecom. As we've seen in in Puerto Rico, particularly, their whole system was wiped out in addition to other challenges they have. Can you give us an update about the communications resiliency plan? Well, so the, and 
the telecommunications work is incorporated into the overall work right. that we're doing with the Climate Change Adaptation Task Force. Uh, we've done some really extensive uh, analysis with each of the partners in that task force. We're working with a national laboratory uh, to analyze the interdependencies. It's, it's a really robust analysis. We still have um, more work to do, but we've absolutely incorporated the telecommunications pieces into that. Uh, it's been helpful. Have you gotten uh, cooperation from the communications industries, uh, you know, as far as the AT&T, Verizon's, Time Warners of the world? I believe we have, and I, if there are specific instances of something we haven't gotten, it, I haven't heard about it, and so I think we're getting the information we need. Because that is an issue that we still hear about. Uh, can you reach emergency service? People always say, you know, at a previous hearing, uh, and I have much respect for Commissioner Esposito. I think he's doing an incredible job. But their message is emergency happens, you call 911. Many people cannot reach 911 during that time. So the question is, are we better prepared for, in terms of that? I don't know if you, if you could shed light on that. Um, I mean, I know that there have been definite upgrades to the tele telecommunication system, and by replacing much of the copper system with fiber, that's already making the system more robust and more able to handle um, challenges. But uh, the privately owned telecommunication companies continue to invest in their own resiliency, but I think we have to um, get into that with them, uh, and we could follow up with you. Because some of them, their systems went down. Yep, some survived, but some went down, and this is this is still an issue. And I want to note, uh, Councilmember Crowley shared the story, but in Queens, that uh, a firebox is what actually alerted the FDNY to the fire in Breezy during Sandy. It wasn't actually a phone call. Uh, and so we need to protect those uh, gadgets that some people see as antiquated, but actually, I think, help save lives uh, in the case of Sandy. Uh, so that's still a part of our, that's, that's staying, is that correct? Uh, to your knowledge, or are you not sure? Oh, I don't, I'm not it's, sure if I knew that. It's staying. Good. And it's getting a sizable investment. All right, Director Graff. Right. Very, yeah. very good. Good answer. <laughs> good, good answer. Short-term measures. I think that we heard before about uh, there's, you're awaiting some results uh, of a study for the Rockaways, or, uh, Councilman uh, Orich's district. What are some short-term measures, or have, are we exploring them uh, in the meantime while we wait for these federal dollars to hopefully one day come in that we can do now? Uh, we discussed the, the possibility, the idea of potential dunes in some of our beaches that don't have them right now. I mean, again, I keep being told by people how we're 13 feet above elevation in my, in my district and the beaches, but you, 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 you and I know that we're still vulnerable, even, even at that elevation. So um, are there short-term measures that we're looking at? Well, and, and as we've discussed many times, the, um, the creek itself ends up being the lowest-lying portion of uh, vulnerability for much of um, particularly the western end of Coney Island, and so we have... Uh, directed funds towards the creek itself and that we're going to be investing to raise some of those lowest level areas where water gets in first. That's proceeding. Um, and the, the mayor himself committed at the town hall that what, you know, we're, tar we're setting our sights on a more resilient um, beach and boardwalk in Coney and we have more work to do to figure out how to, um, you know, what that's going to look like and how we're going to proceed on that path. But there's definitely a commitment to continue analyzing this to ultimately get to a more resilient Coney Island. Is that a part of the – is he relying on the Army Corps study, or is he talking about maybe a city plan? I, I think it's a little bit of both, right? We don't want to preclude federal um, investment, um, and so we have some work to do to figure out the, the right path on that. Uh, and, you know, and all of that is – there's $2 billion being spent in Coney Island, whether it's through the hospital and the NYCHA campuses and other, other infrastructure – that are continuing to make Coney Island safer. Um, but yes, we have more vulnerability on the creek that we're working to address, and we have more work to do on the beaches um, uh, along that way, and we want right. to work with you on that. Right, because as you know, we're a peninsula, so it's, I guess, there's some individual properties, but right. you have Atlantic Ocean, Graves and Bay, and the creek all converge, and so you need a more system-wide plan and vision, and that's why these, these studies are so important and to get implemented and to get funded. Correct. Um, Final questions that we have here. Um, is there a primary person who oversees all the city's resiliency projects in the sense where uh, there's a, a point person? I know Bill Goldstein previously served in this role as the czar in, in this role. But a person that deals with all the agencies, whether it's DEP, parks, uh, you know, buildings, all these agencies every, each and every day. Is that you, Director Zoe, or 
So as far, yeah, go ahead. So the, well, the resiliency program uh, and all of our climate change work, uh, yes, um, and we work very closely with Amy Peterson and her team on the housing recovery program, and this has the full attention of the mayor and the deputy mayors that uh, oversee our teams, and so there is clear accountability for what we're trying to accomplish. We've leveraged the infrastructure of the city to be able to make sure that we can move as much of this as quickly as possible, and I think we've, uh, we've shown the ability to deliver on projects, and we have plenty more to do uh, on that front as we go along. So you're satisfied with the level of coordination and communication between all the agencies at this point about re our resiliency work? The, the internal city coordination, I think, has been fantastic. I think we have a lot of great um, uh, cooperation from agencies, uh, the work of uh, all of the FEMA money that it probably touches almost every single agency. We're moving those projects forward. All of the other bigger complicated infrastructure, we're working together to move them forward. So. Um, you know, where we have uh, natural complications is you get outside of the city family and we have to work with lots of others and we're, you know, there's been good partnership as there, there as well too, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily report to us. We have to use our influence and, uh, and other means to make sure that we're achieving what we need for New Yorkers. But, you know, I, I would just leave, I'll leave you with this on, on, on that point is that um, with regards to, for example, the, the vision for Coney Island Creek, that's a, it's a multi-layer project that's yep. very complex that is still in the works. It's going to involve Parks Department land and property. Um, we still have not had, a, I would say, a detailed discussion about what the those parks connecting, that land connecting this potential floodgate system will look like. Mm. Uh, and so even with my, I mean, I, I have a conceptual look of what this might look like, but we need some more details to share with the community, of course, and also with my office about uh, the area of Calvert, Vo Calvert Vox Park to the north in, in the area of Gravesend and the area by Kaiser Park and Coney Island. It's not clear to me what exactly, they, w what they will look like, uh, where will it go? It, and it's quite honestly, it's not clear to any of us yet because you know we've done some study and we did some analysis and, and I think you've seen all of that analysis, but it's uh, feasibility level analysis. It's not necessarily, it, you know, it's certainly not construction documents and by Delivering our analysis to the Army Corps and getting Southern Brooklyn and uh, Coney Island Creek incorporated in the Rockaway Reformulation Plan, now we've got to get into their process, and they haven't uh, done as much design there as they've done in Jamaica Bay, and so there isn't there isn't more information to be known, and we've got to get the Army Corps to continue taking more steps but, to, but, to develop those ideas. But is there a commitment that once the Army Corps completes their study, which I or the report, I think, which I think is in March 2018, if I'm not mistaken, that this, the administration will come back t to us and, and, and the council and, of course, my community and discuss what these plans and visions will look like in, in, in great detail. Well, I, th I think we need the Army Corps to do that. Um, right. They well, will be running those studies. That's and, first. And, and right. we should be pushing them to come in and brief us at that right moment, and that would include you to be able to understand what those plans look like. And if there are impacts to our city facilities, then we'll have to discuss that as well. Um, and hopefully get those incorporated in the Army because Corps project as well. I'm looking to Staten Island as this model where you have certainly a major resiliency project that's necessary and needed, and simultaneously, and it's going to be it's, it's going to meet the FEMA flood, flood insurance standards, which could, which could offset their cost. But there's also going to be enhancements to their public assets. There'll be beautiful, I guess, green space, green green space along along the project. If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, is that correct? Well, one of the major features is the um, is the boardwalk that would be continued on top of the levee, which is in the design there, and so that oh, would be enhanced. Don't we love boardwalks in New York City? Oh, wow, we really do. Yeah. Historic uh, ones as well. Historic ones, right. So that's the model. I think protection of, of, of lives and property, meeting flood insurance standards, and, and enhancement of public assets. That's, as Rathel's already nodding his head, that's what we're, we're going to fight for. And my district also for Councilmember Margaret, Margaret Chin as well. And that's our and, goal as well. Right. And the, the final question I have is, do you anticipate any further action plan amendments for CDBG DR funding, and when? I would say yes. I'm going to break this up into pieces. <laughs> we certainly anticipate further action plan amendments. Do you know? Uh, we don't know when, and we don't know exactly. You know, the whole point of the action plan process is that you make amendments over time as your expectations turn out to be not exactly what happens. So you have expectations for one program, it costs more. You have expectations for another, it turns out it actually costs less. And you have the flexibility with this within this block grant system to move the funds around as necessary as 
costs change, but also as needs change. Right. And it's likely that we might be doing another action plan amendment in the first half of 2018. But what is um, teed up for that is not 100% set right now. Right, and I, I, would, I would just appreciate that, you know, we try to consult with each other about that, um, you know, as, uh, so to make sure that our priorities are all aligned from the administration level, city council, to the local level, because I think our feedback could be very helpful in shaping these amendments as well. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I, and I, and I thank the panel. Th thank thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have... Okay, so I'd like to call up uh, Rowan Lewis, Waterfront Alliance. Okay, Ms. Mr. Lewis, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Roland Lewis, Waterfront Alliance. Is the microphone on? Uh, yes, it is. Good, good. All right. Uh, an alliance of uh, over a thousand businesses and civic organizations, and many right in your district. Uh, I'd like to give a few a few thoughts to uh, uh, comment on what we heard today, and uh, also uh, some uh, tools we've developed at the Waterfront Alliance to address um, uh, the ongoing and uh, continuing and increasing threat of sea level rise and flooding. Uh, so obviously uh, our, our uh, area remains vulnerable to uh, sea level rise and due to climate change, exacerbated by um, uh, man-made uh, disasters in Washington by uh, climate change deniers and are, uh, at the highest levels of government, potential cutbacks in uh, CDBG funds, et cetera, as you've uh, uh, recognized today. Um, uh, we are also, as we see, uh, each time we hear a, pro a projection from our scientists, it gets worse and worse and worse. The uh, United Nations said the maximum of three feet in 2013. NASA in 2015 said the maximum on the far end was eight feet. Eight feet is, uh, is game over for many uh, areas of New York, including, uh, unfortunately, your, your district. So we have to uh, <laughs> take seriously and uh, and. and pay careful attention to the science as it, as it develops. We've developed a, 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 a new tool, which uh, I think has taken off in a, in a pretty strong way in your district. We've talked to your, uh, the local paper there, as well as the New York Times and others, about it called the Harbor Scorecard, which measures uh, three metrics, uh, that of uh, uh, resiliency, how many feet get wet in, in, any, in any community board, water quality, as well as access. And the, you know, the, the bottom line, and we talk about 100 years of stars, but uh, um, uh, 400,000 New Yorkers have a 50% chance of, of flooding um, by year 2060. That's uh, one, one in two odds is, uh, is different than I'm thinking about it. One, and that's a, a lot of people, that's the size of Miami or New Orleans, other, other flood prone cities. Uh, we call for a regional approach. Uh, the fish don't care where the water, the, the boundaries are, and neither does the, the, the flood. So, um, the Waterfront Management Advisory Board, a, a sort of semi-dormant but hopefully revived mechanism that the city has uh, had might be a great way for organizations like ours, which broach the, the, the borders, to go further. But there should be a, eventually a commission or some sort of, uh, to that last question you just a asked um, about interagency. We do pretty well on the city side, but there, it, it is a regional, a regional challenge. Um, uh, last question. Uh, uh, if I may, yes. Um, uh, there, there, there is no silver bullet. I, I you know, the, the uh, giant floodgate is possible, but we must. People are making real-time decisions all the uh, all the time. We have developed another tool called uh, Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, 
uh, which has taken off in a, uh, uh, now with the, the cooperation of the Rockefeller Foundation and their 100 Resil Resilient Cities program is taking off nationwide. I was actually in Tel Aviv not too long ago talking about it. Um, it is a, uh, a way for people, when, whether it's a tugboat operator, or a park administrator, or a major developer. We're about to announce on uh, Halloween two more uh, projects, Greenpoint Landing and um, uh, also the uh, Bronx River uh, Starlight Park up uh, in the Bronx, two more wedge certified projects. This is a way for people, uh, stakeholders, to uh, have at their fingertips and communities at their fingertips the best ideas in, in engineering ecology to create more resilient waterfronts. And finally, I, you know, I, I think it goes without saying, as you know well in, in your district and many other districts, as, uh, as the other council members have uh, know, uh, we, the most vulnerable populations are at the water's edge, and we must always be aware that uh, it's, our, it's incumbent upon us to uh, not just protect, of course, the, uh, the, the uh, Wall Street downtown, but every, every, every neighborhood where, where uh, there's a vulnerability and uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, minority populations, the underprivileged populations need to be as much protected as anybody else. New York uh, has, uh, I think, is actually ahead of the game uh, relative to other cities that I've seen around the world or around the country for sure and has the ability to be uh, uh, the climate change leader. This, this committee and our mayor have, uh, ha I think, have, especially under this, in this political climate, incumbent responsibility to, to demand, advocate, and scream that we address uh, 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 smartly climate change uh, adaptation, not just for this, this coastal city, but for every other coastal city around the country and, and, and further around the world. The world is changing, and we need to lead and be proactive. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Thank you very much for your leadership and uh, really very important points that, that you've made uh, in your very important testimony, and I, and I agree. And look, I, I, I haven't been shy in, in uh, calling out some of the areas that we need to improve on in the city's efforts, but I do acknowledge that uh, we do have a mayor that at least acknowledges the, the, these challenges and acknowledges that climate change is real. and is really trying to work as, as hard as possible with his, uh, he has some great staff with him, great team that, that, do, that does acknowledge uh, what we have to do. And I, again, I, I repeat that whether you live in my district or in Red Hook or Staten Island or whether you live in Houston, Texas, I can safely predict that folks in Houston will be having the same conversations that we're having right now. I'm hoping it's not gonna take five, six years. Hope, I'm hoping it's as fast as obviously humanly possible, but Unfortunately, these recovery processes are painful uh, processes, but they will have the same conversations, and they're going to have the same conversations with their Congress members and their senators, and whether they live in Florida as well. And they might be Republican or Democrat. So to me, this is just an outright American priority and how to better protect our people, our, our, our most vulnerable, um, and you're absolutely correct. So I, I think that this is a major, major priority that we have to continue, obviously, uh, you know, planning and dealing with the effects of climate change, which is already happening now, but we need these resources desperately. Uh, and, and again, I, I want to thank you. The Alliance uh, has really been a great organization doing a lot of great work, so I thank you for being here today. My pleasure. Thanks, sir. Um, and if not, if that is it, uh, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>